Hey everyone, it's three questions with Rob Pethel. There we go. Got music. All right. So today we have Rob Pethel on the podcast, and he's actually from Atlanta Public Schools. Atlanta Public Schools. I have been able to work with some of the most wonderful people. So I'm gonna give you a little. A shout out if you're a student in Atlanta Public Schools. Um, Rob and I connected. Um, you know, I know you're at GATC uh, recently. It's a honestly, um, the I, I like I'm gonna mess it up. It's like the Georgia Educational Technology Conference. Is that right? You got it. That's it. Yeah. And legit, one of my favorite conferences I've ever been to. Some of the nicest people I've ever met. Uh, just absolutely wonderful. And you and I connected there in person, but we talked a, a little bit before. So Rob actually teaches um, music at the Atlanta, is it Atlanta Public Schools Virtual Academy? Am I saying that all right? It's the Atlanta Virtual Academy from the Atlanta Public Schools. There you go. And so um, I have a very special place in my heart for music. And so I was really excited to have uh, Rob on the podcast. And, you know, even though he connects with music, he does leadership stuff, design thinking, a ton of other things too. And we're going to kind of really dig into that um, in the second podcast, but we're going to start with the three questions. And I, I was telling you this before, my music teacher, Cindy Penrose, is probably one of my biggest inspirations um, as a teacher has made such an impact on my life. And you and I were talking about this before the podcast, all the stuff that I learned in music has led me to so many other things that don't, aren't necessarily connected to music, but what I learned in, you know, my music and my acting classes really has benefited me. So that's who's one of my inspiration is, and is actually one of the first podcasts I talked about her. But when you think of a teacher who really inspired you, who's someone you think of and why? Oh, man. Okay. So, um, well, first of all, I got to point out how similar our sets okay. are. You got a little shelf and a ukulele. Absolutely. I can't and, play uh, it, though. You can play yours. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I also got to say, uh, I first kn knew about you uh, the beginning of, uh, I think it was last year when the principal at our academy, uh, Kamisha Perry Evans, she said, hey, I got a book for you. Oh, look at that. I got the same book. I know. And so if I put it on my shelf, we can be twinsies almost. Look at okay? that. I love it. I love it. So uh, there you go. There's 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 some product placement. So right. that book was that book was great. I, I read read it. Uh, I resonated with so much of it okay. uh, because innovation and and uh, it's just it's just crucial. But back to your question about about teachers. Oh wow, okay, you you got a good one on me there because um, we've had so many teachers. And you learn from your childhood. It could be someone you work with. Yeah, because I know I, there's so many to pick from, right? Obviously. I gotta say, it's 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 gotta be my um, it's gotta be my main. Uh, my, my guitar professor in college, it's got to be John Sutherland, who he, he passed away a couple years ago. Um, he was kind of a rebel. He was kind of Johnny Cash of classical, I love that. classical world. Uh, he insisted on being called by his first name, even though he was had all the credentials. Um, and he uh, it was very philosophical. He, he, he managed to get to your to your heart before anything. And he would almost deconstruct you right on the spot to to get past, like, you know, the whole breaking the ice phase and go very psychological, very spiritual, went went straight for it. And one quick story about John, I remember we had we had kind of a bad boy in our in our group. He's kind of he thought he was, he was just kind of tough guy. And he goes in for his first lesson and he sits down and he's kind of got this look on his face. And and John's probably 65, but still kind of a big guy. And he says, uh, you want to go outside and fight right now? That's the first thing you said to him. Really? And, and he caught him off guard and he was able to, to calm him down. And they actually had a good relationship, but he, he, he could just <laughs> sense what somebody's first issue was and then right. go right in for it, dismantle it, and then, then get on to the, the subject matter at hand. And I, and I save a little bit of that with everything that I do. When you, when you have class and you're teaching students, yeah. Um, I might have, I might have a lesson that I want to teach them, but they're not going to be able to receive that lesson unless we can kind of get them in that good place, yeah. which also resonates with a lot of that, you know, traditional, uh, educational, you know, hierarchy, uh, what was that guy? Uh, Maslow's hierarchy. No, that's not. Yeah. You got to bloom before you, whatever, right? Yes. Taxonomy, right? That's you got to have, you got to be, feel safe and, and ready to learn. So yeah, I'll say it's John Sutherland, Georgia state. University guitar uh, professor, uh, his his things just 
stuck in my head. And the last thing I'm gonna tell you about John, he he did get me. Uh, I was having a rough channel. I was having a rough chapter um, in college one time. I just because classical guitar is very hard. Yeah, classical guitar is ins- classical guitar is insane. I grew up playing different styles. You know, guitar can be a, a, a nice entry level instrument. You can teach yourself guitar, but when you get to that classical stuff, it's, it's crazy. So I, I was struggling, and John. John said, uh, he goes, Rob, you're struggling right now, and you're either going to, you're either going to achieve the goals and and have a breakthrough, or this is going to bother you for the rest of your life. Mm. And then he goes, okay, I'll see you next week. (laughs) And, and uh, that was 25 years ago. And and it's like, I I stuck with it. I didn't, I didn't, uh, it, it doesn't bother me for the rest of my life. But that's, it's like you can't run away from your problems. You just gotta you gotta do it. That was John. I love it. I'll give John a little applause for the uh, just full disclosure. Don't call on your students, right? No fighting, <laughs> fighting in class. We were in a little bit different time when that actually happened, but uh, yes, and we were in college, right? We we're in college, and so yeah. There's there's so many there's so many uh, professors and teachers I had that kind of remind me of what you shared that at the time you're like, what the heck is going on with this person? Like, this is so not like what I'm expecting. And then you look back and you're like, and, and weirdly enough, I'm sure it's the same way with you. There's so many things that you probably do similar to what he did that you were like at time, like, I can't believe this is happening. Right. And then you kind of see the effectiveness of this because you know, that the impact that that those words are still sticking with you are, are really, really powerful. So mm, yeah, you, you already mentioned, a you know, uh, someone, a principal you work with who obviously has a big inspiration because they gave my book. Right. So obviously, so you think of an administrator and we were talking before, I, I don't say leader specifically, uh, cause I want to highlight an administrator because I think when we think of leaders, we often just use that word synonymously with, uh, principals, assistant principals, and some of the best leaders in our schools are our custodians, are our teachers, are some of our students. And sometimes some of the worst leaders in our schools could be principals, right? And so the, the, I'm looking specifically for an administrator uh, to, to answer. So when you think of an administrator, whether someone you went to worked with, mm-hmm. uh, you know, somebody has a kid, who's someone you think of and why? Well, let's keep it to Atlanta public schools uh, where I've been for 16 years. And let's see, I have had one two three four five six in the last year I've, I've, I've had six i've had six principals right <laughs> yeah the turnover is crazy i've had six principals and i've learned stuff from each one of them right. sometimes what to do and sometimes what not to do mm-hmm. uh in fact I, I would say that one of my I, I learned so much from an administrator that i actually uh did not have a good relationship with about how not to handle things in certain situations. But I, if we're going to keep it on who's influenced me the most, um, it's going to be Audrey Sofianos. That was the first principal that I had at Sutton Middle School. Let's give her a little, let's give her a little shout out. Another, another Greek connection, by the way, Audrey go. Sofianos. And she was fantastic. She's still, uh, she's still in the game. And she, she, um, she hired me. At Sutton, at Sutton Middle School in Atlanta, Georgia, um, there was a position for a, a chorus teacher. Mm. I was not, um, I've been in choir before, but I'm not a vocalist. I'm an instrumentalist. And the position was for choir. I was like, okay, uh, I need a job, so I'm going to take this position. So I interview, um, get hired, and it turns out that they were actually more interested because I could speak Spanish mm-hmm. and because I played guitar than me being a uh, great vocalist or or whatever. So I come into the I come in there and and it just showed me also job applications and what's out there. There's more than what is just out there. When you're looking for a job, you might see a title that says chorus teacher. I might say that's not what I want and keep looking. But I went in and I investigated that job. Hmm. Um, you want to hear a, little, a quick story about about Absolutely. that whole thing? Okay. So I had, you know, you had, you're supposed to apply online usually before you, before you do things. Um, and I did the application online, but I needed, I needed to talk. I needed to see somebody face to face to know that they got my, my application. So I just, uh, I put on a coat, sport coat, 
and I just have my resume printed out. <clears throat> I'm, <clears throat> let's see, I'm like 27 years old. I just go to the school during the summer. They let me in. There's hardly anybody in the building. But there is a family trying to communicate with the receptionist. And the family was a Spanish speaking family. The receptionist did not speak Spanish. I speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. I walk into the office and I'm just, I have nothing to do with that situation, but I kind of walk into a situation and they're having a communication breakdown. And then I I just say, would you like me to translate? They say, yes. And they were just asking about report cards when they're coming out. So I did a quick translation. They were happy. The family left. The, then the receptionist is looking at me. She's like, who are you? And I was like, well, uh, I want to be your new music teacher. She goes, well, all the admins not here today. So, um, but give me your resume and I'll see what I can do. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay. And I leave. And it's because of that chance reaction that I had, that chance situation with that Spanish translation, that that receptionist, when the principal came back two days later, um, she said, I found I found who should be our next music teacher and see about influence. Right. That was reception. That was not a leadership, quote unquote. Right. But it was because she saw something in me mm. and then she passed it on, which gave me like the front seat of the interview. So that, that was huge. That, wow. that whole process. Then when I get into the interview with the principal and we, we get hired, it turns out that I can do a lot more at that job than just be the chorus teacher. Mm. So you got to keep looking. And then she was more interested in me teaching in me, uh, uh, teaching guitar, popular music, songs in Spanish, songs in English, multicultural stuff. So that's how it worked out. So she gave me all the chances. She was supportive. Uh, she gave me feedback when I needed it. She gave me a Mac computer. She gave me an Apple computer, which is the <laughs> most important thing. So she gave me the tools that I needed. So I got to say thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Audrey Sofianas. Appreciate you. Audrey. Audrey. Love it. So I actually just, uh, I just wrote a book. It's in the first draft. It's called what makes a great principal. And you just totally re-emphasize something that I wrote. And I wrote this with, uh, my good friend, Allison apps. we had some great contributors to this book and my, uh, former principal who I write about extensively in my, uh, uh in the opening, her name is Kelly Wilkins. And when I started working for her, she, it, I applied for a middle school position. So it wasn't middle school math. It wasn't middle school uh, science. It was just, you're going to teach grade five to nine. So I'm like, That's it. Just I don't know what it is. So I applied and basically you have the whole gamut of people teaching different things, applying for this. And her mentality, which I think is so unique, but should be common, was her mentality was we are going to find the best person and then we will shift the classes to that person, as opposed to limit it to, we have a grade six science teacher leaving. So we have to find someone who specifically teaches grade six science. So like probably within the school, someone else could have taught the subjects that are there. So she looked at like, how does a person fit the culture? What gifts do they bring that, you know, we're missing out right now. And it's just such a unique way. Whereas I still see the grade two position, right? But someone in your school might want to teach grade two, because the thing is it's, it's easier to get someone awesome than it is to get an awesome grade two specific teacher. And like, what, what can you teach and what can't you teach? And I just, I, I, when you talk about Audrey seeing that, 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 you know, there's things that you have that you're like, Hey, you'll figure out choir, (laughs) right? Yeah. Other things that are really, really important that you already are bringing to the table. Exactly. Exactly. And start, yeah, start with the ingredients, start with the best raw ingredients and then may, and then work from there. I love it. All right. So last question, you said you've been in education 16 plus years. I know you were, you know, you didn't go straight into education out of college. You did some other stuff, but you go back to your first year of teaching all the stuff that you know, now all the leaders, all the administrators you've had, all the teachers you work with, what advice would you give to your first year teacher self? Uh, what's that line from uh, finding Nemo just keep swimming. You know, like yeah. keep moving forward. Don't like tr- trust your gut. Don't. Uh, I had a good friend, Robert Weatherly, taught with the first year, and he came to me before the first day of class. He saw I was a first year teacher. He came up. He goes, "Well, whatever happens, just don't let the kids get to you. Mm-hmm. Like, don't let them. He goes, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna try. They're gonna frustrate you. Don't let them get to you." That was his exact words. Um, 
And that one, that stuck. Like, don't hang up on, like, you're going to have some weird stuff happen. Right. Don't, don't be afraid to make friends with everybody in the building from the people that you think can't help you, but actually they can. Yep. Learn, learn that the, the custodian and the, re- the receptionist <clears throat> have keys that can get you into any room that you need to get into. Be yourself to your students. Don't try to be that formal idea of a teacher. Be, be yourself, even if it's not what you, it's like, you know, you might be afraid, like, oh, I don't want to show them that side of me because they're going to think that it's cheesy. They're going to think I'm out of touch, but being authentic, they're, they're going to see that even if they don't resonate with it, they're going to see that. You know, it's funny you say that because I think I was probably the kid that if I knew I could get under your skin, I would get under your skin. Yes. And so like, I would, oh, like, oh, okay. That, and you know, uh, the students, sometimes they connect with that and it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's reality. And I remember one of our students we had, uh, would do that to some of our staff Mm -hmm. and they would just get more and more upset. I said, what you have to see with this kid is they actually have a skill. They can read people really, really well. And so our job is to develop that skill for good instead of evil, because they're using it for evil right now. So it's actually, you know, how do we actually get this kid to see like, Hey, this is a really powerful thing that you have the ability to do, but you're not using it in a good way. And so mm-hmm. when I, I remember having that conversation and some of my staff started looking at the kid differently and he actually ended up doing really, really well, <laughs> really enough. He became a lawyer, <laughs> but I don't know, if it, you know, yeah. some would argue that's not for good, but whatever, uh, you know, I, it, but it was like the, the, he could read people very, very well. And so we wanted him to see that talent because, uh, the way we reacted to him also sometimes made it worse. Like it was like a, a mud monster, right? If you threw mud at him, you're like <laughs> stronger. Right. And, so, then, and then, and then he just sits back and he's like, yeah, I'm winning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, and I, I would go back and forth with him. Right. And he knew he's like, yeah, I, I like it wouldn't, there was a, there was a moment I've shared the story before, uh, someone came to speak at our schools and they said, and it was like a moment. And they said, never let an eight year old ruin your day. And it like, it hit me. I'm like, Oh my God, I am like crying. Cause like eight year old kids are calling me poo poo head. Like it's throwing me off. And And and, I am, I am literally this, he's talking to me right now. And then it was just like a switch. I'm like, yeah, like a lot of these times, these kids are not, they're not giving me a hard time. They're having a hard time at home. And I'm just the person that's closest to them. And that's right. So and, it was and, like, yeah, it was kind of an awakening for me. And maybe, maybe when they're giving you all that stuff, it's a good feedback because you're like, wait a minute, why aren't you thinking about what I'm trying to teach you? You're actually being distracting instead of saying this kid has bad behavior. It's like, well, hold on. Whatever I'm saying is just, it's just not tracking with him. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a good time to look back and be like, okay, whenever you have issues with classroom management and let's say you have an issue in your class, you have a fight breakout, you have uh somebody being inappropriate, something happens, you always look back. And in my situation, I'm like, man, it's because I had a weak lesson that day. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes the, the issue is, uh, is not the issue, right? Like it's not the issue. Yeah. But that, that advice, don't let an eight year old ruin your day. That's, that's kind of what, what my friend Weatherly was saying. Don't oh. let them get under your skin. Don't let them bother you. All right. Well, Robbie, obviously I have lots of wisdom. I'm looking forward to digging in more, but everyone, thank you so much for listening. Rob, thanks for taking time out of your out of your break to do this. So I appreciate that. So that's right. Listening. Have a wonderful day. All right. Bye-bye.